Hello everyone and welcome back to Always Watching. Today we're discussing the new Netflix documentary, What Jennifer Did. So briefly, the documentary chronicles a violent crime that shook a quiet Canadian town. The case was infamous at the time and Jennifer's interrogations with the police are available on YouTube if you have time. I remember hearing about this case and being shell-shocked at the time. As a child of immigrant parents, I totally understand the pressure to succeed. However, there's a difference between killing someone in the heat of the moment or an argument to actively trying to plot their murder for a number of years. If you're unfamiliar with the story, the documentary will shock you. If you already have information, it won't really add anything new. The documentary focuses on the investigation from the vantage point of the police. We are basically watching detectives relive the moment they came to realize that Jennifer was not a victim, but a mastermind. The documentary utilizes police interviews, as well as interviews from Jennifer's classmates and close friends of the Han family. The documentary opens up with a frantic 911 call and Jennifer's first interview with the police. When you compare her first interview to her last, it's terrifying because our first impression of Jennifer is that she seems very innocent. She seems very believable, like her demeanor, like she's very quiet very small, soft-spoken individual. Like she really doesn't look like she could hurt a fly. But briefly, Jennifer is the only daughter of Vietnamese immigrants. It seems like they had a very comfortable life. Her parents owned the home that they lived in. They had two cars and they made enough money to support Jennifer through school. Everyone that knew the family described them as very peaceful and quiet. Initially, when the murders took place, there were rumors that they may have been involved in criminal activity. However, as the police started to investigate, they didn't really find anything suspicious. The Pan family either owned everything they had or they could afford it through hard work. Like they were not living a lavish lifestyle or a lifestyle they they could not afford. It took some time for the police to land on a suspect. So in this case, a man a young man named Danny Wong, who was a drug dealer and also former boyfriend of Jennifer Pan. Danny Wong was essentially the tripwire the police needed to start turning their attention to Jennifer. What makes Jennifer so terrifying is that she seems very innocent. The documentary doesn't like talk, just talk to a lot of people from her life, like her former teachers, her former classmates. We don't really get a lot of that and I wish we did just so we can better understand what was going on in her head during this time. From what we gather of Jennifer's former classmate and piano teacher, she was a very outgoing individual and she was incredibly talented, very social. However, she was very far from being valedictorian. She grew up in an area filled with first generation children where all their parents expected them to become doctors, lawyers, accountants. The term tiger parenting has been used to describe Jennifer's parents. Tiger parenting refers to when a parent is overly involved in their child's extracurricular and academic life in order to ensure success. Her parents would literally pick her up and drop her off everywhere she went and this oversight started to drive her crazy the older she got. Personally I can relate like I've never been a science or you know I, I was never going to become an accountant like I was more of an English person more of a drama person okay. and a lot of first generation children end up pursuing careers that make money at the expense of their emotional and mental health. Jennifer's parents had an expectation of her that she either didn't want to meet or couldn't meet and they infantilized her and they isolated her they didn't give her a lot of independence especially the older she got and a lot of children that come from immigrant households can relate. Like your parents want you to be successful, but they don't want you to be free, right? They never want you to be too far away from them. Like you really have to fight for that freedom and that independence because they'll try to hold on to it for as long as possible. And I think her parents definitely noticed that something was off with Jennifer and they hoped that by going to school and getting a job, eventually her problems would go away. And the problem with a lot of parents is that they don't want to acknowledge sometimes that their child is not the person they want them to be. And so they, they go into a state of denial or judgment. So it seems Jennifer had a history of self-harm. And after leaving high school, she spent four years 
tricking her parents into believing that she was going to university. They would pick her up and drop her off thinking she was going to class, when in fact she would spend her time either at a coffee shop or with her boyfriend. She went as far as even forging a university degree to make them believe that she graduated. How she was able to fool her parents for so long is incredibly impressive. Again, I'm sure they suspected something, but they probably didn't suspect this. After graduation, the walls started closing in on her. The longer she remained unemployed, the more suspicious her, her parents became. She claimed to be volunteering at a children's hospital, but her parents grew suspicious when they didn't notice a uniform or any ID or, or badge and they decided to follow her, follow her to work one day only to discover that she was lying to them. To make matters worse, they also discovered that she did not graduate from university. And according to Jennifer in these police interviews, her parents wanted their money back. Jennifer's ability to lie to her parents was obviously a huge red flag for the police. Besides academic pressure, Jennifer also faced a personal crisis. When Jennifer first met Danny Wong, she grew a very unhealthy obsession with him. Unfortunately for her, he was a drug dealer and worked at a pizza place, neither of which was acceptable for her father. According to her classmates and her piano teacher, she was really obsessed with her boyfriend. Her classmate notes how she would spend thousands and thousands of dollars on gifts for him and just buying him whatever he needed. During his interrogation, Danny describes these mysterious phone calls that he was getting leading up to the murder. This mysterious caller would tell him to watch his back, that they, they could see what he was doing. And a few days before the murder, this caller went as far as saying bang, bang, bang. And my impression of Danny is that he might be the worst liar in the world. Like everything about him just seemed very flimsy. He didn't seem very confident in the story that he was telling. It just, it just didn't feel all that believable. Like you could tell that he was hiding something big. The only reason that Danny likely got involved with the murder is for financial gain. Her parents had a half million dollar life insurance policy and he probably, probably believed that because she still loved him, he could convince her to give him a good portion of that. Jennifer's obsession with Danny is really important because it was one of many breaking points in her life. Her piano teacher and her former classmates note that she was very depressed when she wasn't around him and she likely did blame her parents for the deterioration of her relationship. And this relationship, again, it's, it's definitely a red flag but it's certainly not enough to suggest that she would mastermind killing her own parents. Like at the very worst, maybe someone that Jennifer was associated with, like Danny, was involved. But again, they couldn't really imagine that it was her. And the police didn't really have all that much to go on. They had a security footage that only showed them the number of assailants, but that's it. However, they did have a few reservations and doubts about Jennifer from the very beginning. First, there were no signs of a break-in. Second, no money or valuables were stolen. Third, Jennifer's phone call was very, very suspect because she claims that she was tied to a banister. So how, how was she able to make this call when her hands were behind her back? And finally, the police couldn't really understand why on earth these intruders would let Jennifer live. And I thought the documentary did a good job of organizing each of the interrogation tapes. So they'll give us the first interview, give us some context, give us the second interview, give us some context. So, so then we kind of can understand Jennifer's mindset each time and how the police were approaching her differently the more they find out. The second time Jennifer is interviewed by the police, they suspect that she may have been involved. And the thing with Jennifer is that she would just volunteer information. They never thought to check whether or not she actually graduated from university. Like this is a massive lie. And again, there's a difference between lying and forging a whole degree. And once she volunteered this information, she became uh, their primary suspect. In this interview, they also asked her to demonstrate how she was able to make a call with her hands tied behind her back. Her body language, the way that she was moving, like you could tell she was just winging it or just trying her, like she, she didn't really know what to do. And so that also was a massive red flag for them. And despite all of their suspicions, she may have gotten away with it if her father did not wake up from coma. So her mother died instantly. And unfortunately for Jennifer, 
Her father is still alive and he was the one that she wanted to kill the most. His account of what took place was far worse than we could possibly imagine. According to her father, Jennifer's mother went out for the night and he went to bed early. We discover that it's Jennifer who unlocked the door and signaled to the intruders to come in so there was no break-in. And rather than go along with the act, like, you know, tied up with her parents, screaming, her father notices that she just walked down the stairs and started to have a friendly conversation with the intruders. So she obviously knew them very well. And, uh, you know, she, she, she didn't seem worried about getting caught. She didn't seem under duress. She didn't appear to be hurt. Like, she seemed perfectly fine. And we later discover that this is not the first time that Jennifer has tried to kill her parents. She tried to hire someone else prior, but the plan didn't go through. So this plan to kill her parents, it's been in her mind for a number of years. So by the time we get to the third interview, the police have all the information they need. And watching her just sit in the corner, like just like a, a ball, like she knew it was over. And they were just trying to solicit lies from her at this point because they have all the information they needed. They just needed a confession. And I think her text messages were also incredibly revealing because she was texting her ex-boyfriend, still telling him that she loved him, still telling him that she wanted to be with him. And this man told her point blank that he's in love with someone else. And I think in Jennifer's mind, she thought that if she could kill her parents, he would maybe come back to her because there was no one in his way. There was no one judging her, him. Like it could facilitate their, it could make it easier for them to be together. So her motivations were incredibly selfish and self-serving. And that's how the story ends. So at the moment, Jennifer is eligible for a new trial. And this case is quite terrifying because anytime a child murders their parents, you have to wonder why. Because for example, a case like the Menendez brothers, Sometimes there is a motivation if the parents are abusing the child, then you can understand why they did it. But in this case, she just wanted to be with her boyfriend. Like, and the, the depth she would go to to lie to them until basically like she, ha like she lied as much as she could until the only solution was to kill them. And yeah, so it's definitely worth a documentary worth watching. It is a case that's incredibly jarring to me to, to this day. Thankfully, her father survived. And it's kind of scary to think if he had died, she probably would have gotten away with it because there wasn't really anything concrete and certainly nothing to the level that he was saying, right? Like watching your daughter stroll down the stairs while you're tied up. Like that is, that is you can't even make that up. So you guys let me know what you think and until next time.